So in the prayer, I mentioned um, that praise and worship was started sort of, not, not, I, wanna, I don't want to say on accident, but I, I love to tell the story that um, Pastor Dar, who many of you have met, he's here from time to time. He'll be here again a few more times before the year's up. Um, he what, he re- took his retirement from um, uh, St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Eureka, Missouri, up by St. Louis, and they came down, bought a condo in Branson, and um, he, he did want to do mission, but you know, he's kind of like, I'm retired, you know, so kind of more of a part-time. But you know, as you, those of you who know Pastor Dar, wherever he goes, the Lord does stuff, and so this is what happened. And so long story short, he got connected with Faith Lutheran here in Branson, and the discussion was, what if we had a sort of a, a branch out, an arm that came out of Faith Lutheran that was designed specifically to reach people who don't know Jesus? You know, if you go to Faith Lutheran and you walk in the door, it is a traditional Lutheran church, and that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. But what it means is, is there's all these assumptions in place. The assumptions are that you know what it is, you know why it's there, and that you know what to do. Now, if you've never been to church before, or maybe you've been away from church for a long time, those assumptions don't work for, for someone like that. And they can serve as a deterrent or a barrier. So Pastor Dar and the, and the core group that kind of was with him then said, well, what if we had a sort of a mission outreach that took those assumptions and put them on the shelf and had no assumptions other than we want to introduce you to Jesus, right? That's our purpose. That's what we want to do. And that's, that's why very early on, praise and worship became called a Christ-centered disciple-making community. And it's really interesting because... You know, a lot of people will say, well, what's the name of your church? And we'll say, praise and worship. No, 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 what's, you know, because every church has got a name where you had a Lutheran church. I'm like, well, technically, and when I say technically, we'll explain why I say technically. Our name, our, like if you look up our 501c3 or our constitution, we are praise and worship Lutheran church. But we don't fly that flag for a very important reason, which we're going to talk about today. And the reason is, is because we don't, what if there's people out there, and just, just so we're all clear, there's a whole bunch of them, who have no idea what Lutheran even means. Do we want that to be a barrier or a limiting factor to us connecting with them? And that's why on your handout, we're gonna go just a little out of order today because I wanna sort of have this foundation set and then we'll come back and, and go to the top. I want you to go to the back side of the handout and where it says, what does Lutheran mean? Which is kind of a play on words. Any of you guys have read the catechism? Luther's Catechism, every time he says something, he'll say, what does this mean, right? And so this is kind of a, what does Lutheran mean? What does this mean? Um, and it's really interesting um, because a lot of people, a lot of you guys know this story. You know, we, um, a year ago, it was the 500th anniversary. Not a year ago, two years ago now. It just dawned on me. Ooh. And so two years ago, um, it was the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. It was 2017, the events which started the Reformation, which is, which, which, kind of Martin Luther was the lightning rod for that, um, started in, we trace that to 1517, so 200, or 500 years. So um, a lot of people are, does that just mean you guys are just all zoomed in on Martin Luther? Well, there's a paragraph here, and I just want to read it to you. It says, the word Lutheran does not mean that we think Martin Luther was some sort of higher man. Quite the contrary. He, Uncle Marty, we, I love to call him Uncle Marty so that everybody knows we don't think of as a higher man. He was a normal man, and specifically he was a broken man, and he was having this tremendous struggle. He was trying to figure out who is God and what, what do I think of him? How, how do I react to God? What, do, what, what does he expect of me and all of these things? And so... He became, so what happened with Martin Luther, and it's kind of a fun story to tell, he was, he was um, his, his father was not a wealthy man, but had put together all of his resources to, to buy Martin's education to become a lawyer so that Martin could become wealthy and then help his father retire. <laughs> that was literally the plan, and this is well documented. And so... So um, I believe his name is Hans, if I remember right, just my, my brain went blank. Hans goes out and buys this, you know, you, you could buy the education up front, kind of work a deal. So Luther would go back and forth to his, what, we, what they called, ironically, elementary school, but that was what we would call, like, college, right? That's what you was university. And then they would have 
what we would call graduate school was their sort of second level, and then they had actual, what they called university, which we would call like a master's degree. That was kind of how they did their education. And so he was going back and forth, and one night he was walking, I think it was around 18 miles um, from the one town to the other, and along the way there was a thunderstorm. And during the thunderstorm, lightning struck very close to him, within, you know, 20 feet or something like that as the story goes. And it was such an event for him. He, he fell into the dirt and he prayed to Saint Anne, because Martin was raised in the Catholic Church, and they were taught to pray to saints. He prayed to Saint Anne, if you will save me from this calamity, I will become a monk. Well, of course, the calamity was already over by the time he was praying this, and so he was saved. And so um, he went back to his father and he told him, I'm gonna become a monk, I promise Saint Anne. I mean, Hans was mad. I mean, he was just like, what? I paid all this money for you to become a lawyer so that you could bail me out of poverty and now you're going to go be a monk where you have no money and nothing? And it, 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 he was very mad. But Luther did. He went to the monastery. He joined the Augustinian order of monks. And while he was there, he got worse and worse and worse because he began to study the teachings of the church. And in that time, and in many other times, it's not so much that way today in most Catholic churches, but in that time, the way that you, the way that you would study the church and study the teaching of the church would never be to open a Bible. Very few people ever read the Bible in, the, in Martin Luther's life during his upbringing time. Most people would read the various books of what's called the church canon. Okay, canon meaning a list of assigned readings. And so he would, he would read these things and finally he came to the point where he's like, love God, I don't love God, I hate him because he demands more of me than I could ever accomplish. And so he would go to his his, um, what he called his father confessor, and he would confess his sins. And here's some of his confessions. He would say something like this. He would say, Father confessor, today when you were speaking to me, I noticed the mole on your chin. And I couldn't stop looking at it. Forgive me for I have sinned. And this is the kind of stuff he would tell. I mean, he, and he would be, today when I was, when I was you know, scrubbing the floor, there was three tiles in the far right corner that I barely touched. So finally, it famously reported, Staupitz, who was his father confessor, he said to Uncle Marty, he said, would you please go out and do some real sins so that you could come and confess them to me? You know, go gambling, get drunk, do something. Come back and confess to me some real sins. You're not even, and that, that made Luther even more angry. And eventually, in their conflict, um, long story short, I'm making it too long as it is, Luther went to Wittenberg to teach the New Testament. That was what he was there to do. He, so Stoppage was like, you need to go and you need to teach the New Testament and you need to just figure all this all out for yourself. And so what happened was, is through the course of teaching, sometime, in, sometime between 1515 and 15. 20. We don't know exactly when this happened. We do think it was before 1517, because that's when he stood before the emperor and said, here I stand. I can do no other. But we don't have a date. Luther didn't give us a date. There's this blue paragraph there. I want to read you Luther's words, where he says, at last, meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through which the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. Here I felt as if I, was I were entirely born again and had entered paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. And he wrote this after they had collected many dozens of his writings into a book all written in Latin and they asked him to write a foreword. He was very grouchy about that. He's like, don't, 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 people shouldn't read all of those things. They should read Jesus, right? Read, read the Sermon on the Mount, read the book of Romans. Uncle Marty always said everyone should read the book of Romans every day. That's what he said. That's what he said. And so, um, so there we go. So, <laughs> so, right, yeah, yeah, there's, I, I agree with him. I agree with him on that. So then, um, what you have then is this, this discovery, it, which we call, you know, some people will call it his, temp, or his uh, ivory tower moment or something like that. Um, and we don't know all the details of exactly when, because we're just going on what he said. And he doesn't give us, you know, such and such date this happened. Um, but he says that 
Um, this happened, and what happened after that was a series of events, just like dominoes falling. And the world had been, been preparing for this for a long time. God had been preparing the world, you might say, for this for a long time, because the, the Catholic Church had become very corrupt in this time, and the popes were not so much church leaders, although they certainly were. They were landowners, they had militaries to govern, they had all this money and wealth to manage, and, um, and in, in Luther's particular time, they were wanting to do a giant building program. I don't know if you've ever been a part of a church that does a building program. Um, and they were doing a capital fund campaign, is what they were doing, and they needed to raise money because they were building St. Peter's Basilica. It's kind of, a, if you've ever been there, you're like, oh, that building program. Um, and so what they needed was lots and lots and lots of money, and so what was happening is the Pope was sending out um, this guy named John Tetzel, and I think there were a few others, but that was kind of the famous one, because he would go to these towns and he would sell indulgences. And when you go to sell indulgences, basically what you're doing is you could get, you could get an indulgence from the local priest or bishop, but an indulgence was sort of a piece of paper or an announcement, a pronouncement of some sort of release from purgatory or a shortening of purgatory, which you're like, purgatory? That's not in the Bible. Yeah, exactly. And so there was a lot of problems with this whole system. And so right in the middle, as Luther is discovering the gospel, what we would call the gospel, which is Jesus saves us by grace through faith, he's discovering that. At the same time, John Tetzel's coming out into towns around, and he's doing these tent revivals, for lack of a better word, where he sells indulgences. You give money to the church, and we will spring multiple family members out of purgatory. And Luther was like, well, if the church had the power to do it, and of course he was already realizing they didn't, but if the church had the power to do that, why wouldn't they do that out of love for everyone all the time? Why do they need money? And of course, we're all sitting here going, well, yeah, you know, oldest joke in the book, right? And it's not a very funny joke. But I mean, Luther was one of those, everyone, it wasn't, Luther wasn't the first one to think this. You guys know that we would all come to that s similar conclusion at some point, probably. But what was interesting is he was now teaching at a university that had a printing press. Interesting, interesting combination of events. And so his students would take things like the 95 theses that he wrote on the Wittenberg door, which he wrote there to just, that was how you start, you say, I want to have a discussion about this. And so you'd post it on the bulletin board and say, let's have a discussion. You'd invite people to come to town and have a debate. And that's, what, that's how you got things done. That's how you moved the story forward. Um, but his students didn't just let it be that. They went and printed those 95 theses and sent them all over the landscape all over the land and to surrounding territories. And so what happened is, is the people got whipped up into a frenzy, the Pope got word of this, and thus the Reformation began. And that Reformation was a series of events that for us and the way we look back at it culminated in June of 1530, which means here in just, what was that, about 20 or about 13 or 11 years, I mean to say, don't ever let me do math. Don't do it. Um, so in about 11 years, we're going to have another big celebration, a 500th anniversary of what was called the Augsburg Confession. And the Augsburg Confession was this moment when there had been enough time now, a decade had gone by, where they were having these conversations, discussing this. Martin Luther was churning out writings left and right. His students were engaging in more debates. People were coming to town. And, and it was just, you know, the emperor was really not enjoying this at all. And the various princes who governed the territories became a political issue. Everything. It was political, economical. It was cultural and theological. And almost the theological stuff was getting sort of buried amidst the giant political impact that this was having. And so what happened in Augsburg is all of those four primary areas came together to a head where the emperor came to Augsburg and he came there with the expectation that the princes who supported this reformation from these various territories, he came there with the expectation that they would surrender. Because he kind of was like, I'm gonna roll you guys over if you don't. And so they all stepped forward and they, they said, this is what we believe, teach, and confess. And they presented that. And then em the Emperor Charles was like, um, that's not the wrong answer. You know, that's what he said. 
And so he basically, you know, and it's been depicted in the 2003 Luther film. I really like the way it was depicted. I don't know if this ever happened because we don't have a video of the day. But basically the princes, one by one, when Charles said, recant or kind of, I'll be off with your heads, what they did is they offered him their heads. All of them did. And now Charles was faced with a new problem. He, as a political leader of this entire Holy Roman Empire, or what was left of it, had this problem where you had the Turks, we call them, you know, we might call them the Muslim armies or whatever, but they were the Ottoman, basically the precursor of what we would call the Ottoman Empire on one of his borders pushing, right? And he needed these princes' armies and countries to help him fight that war. He could not do it without them. And so because of that reality, and then there was others, certainly the Holy Spirit was moving, um, he couldn't. He couldn't just kill them all. He couldn't do that. So he kind of gruff, gruffly left there with no resolution. Um, but the bottom line is what he didn't realize, or maybe he did, um, is that the Augsburg Confession stood. And that Augsburg Confession, basically what it declares is the church is not an organization of popes and bishops and cardinals and things. The church is wherever God's people are, seeking after Christ through his word. And that changed the world. Before that, there were no denominations or independent churches or anything. There was simply the church. The word Catholic meant universal church. And so now we think of Catholic as a denomination, but the word means universal church. And the reason I tell that whole story is because it's so important to know that where we come from is not a denomination, but a continuous reforming of going back to Jesus. That's our culture and our basis and our foundation. We want, it's literally, there was a, there's a famous, and I'll show this in the weeks to come, there's a famous painting by Louis Cronach that has, a, it has, a, it has Jesus in the center of the painting and over on, it'd be on, on this side as you guys face it, uh, the congregation, and over on this side, Luther's preaching a sermon and all it has is him, he is not talking, his mouth is closed, he's just pointing to Jesus. And, and it's like, that's what Lutheran means. We point people to Jesus. It doesn't mean anything else. Now, there's a lot of other things that have come up inside of that word, but that's what it means. And so when, what the Augsburg Confession does is it points people to Jesus through his word. It does not set forth a new doctrine. Instead, what it does, let's go back to Jesus and see what he says. Let's go back to the apostles and see what they say. Let's go back to the prophets and see what they say. It, it just returns us to the word of God. That's why you've probably heard these famous phrases, sola scriptura, which means scripture alone, and then fides, you know, uh, solos, sola fides, which means faith alone, and sola gratia, which means grace alone. It's just this idea that we don't need all that other stuff. We need Jesus. That's what we need. And it's ironic because that was 500 years ago, and here we are 500 years later, and we need to keep saying that. And when we're all gone, those who come after us, Mariah, you're in charge, they need to say this again, right? And then their kids and their kids need to keep saying this again because the human spirit is broken and we always want to build the scaffolding. We want to build the basilicas. We want to build all those things because then it's something we can see. It's just like, it's just like at, at Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 19 and 20, the Israelites are brought to the mountain and God's like, here I am, you know, and here's the covenant, and yeah. And then they're like, nah, let's build a golden calf. I mean, that's just what humans do. I mean, it was like minutes. <laughs> they didn't have to wait very long. And so they talk about a building program. Imagine people coming and give me all your gold. Give me, give me all, because we're going to melt it down and make an idol, which God said he would kill us if we did that. But, you know, that's not important right now. So I want to do one more thing, and then we're going to read some scriptures. There's a question on the back that says, why no Lutheran on your sign or logo? And I just wanted to make sure everyone understood this before we get too far into it, because it's very, very key. It says, we don't hide the fact that we're a Lutheran church. At no, po at no point will we ever hide that. Um, but we don't lead with it either, because what we want to lead with is Jesus, right? And now what's ironic is a lot of people don't know that um, in, during the time of the Reformation between um, when Luther stood before the emperor the first time and in Augsburg, during that time, the name Lutheran started to become used as a pejorative term. Like the Catholic groups 
would be like, oh, you're one of those Lutherans, you know, and that, that became kind of a pejorative term. And there were some among Luther's camp that kind of embraced it. Like, yeah, that's right, we're the Lutherans. And, and that's kind of, that's part of the thing. But Luther, ooh, he did not like this. Now, technically, right before he, not long before he died, he would sort of begrudgingly be okay with it. But I want you to hear his words from when he was in the middle of all of this. He says, the first thing I ask is that people would not make use of my name and should not call themselves Lutherans, but Christians. What is Luther? The teaching is not mine, nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I, poor stinking bag of maggots that I am, now you get to know his personality a little bit, come to the point where people would call the children of Christ by my evil name? Not so, my dear friends. Let us abolish all party names and call ourselves Christians after him whose teaching we hold. And so that's kind of the heart that praise and worship utilizes, which is ironically Luther's heart in this. Um, and so we always say when we present ourselves to the world, we don't do a party name. Um, we present what we believe, teach, and confess, which is that we are a Christ-centered, disciple-making community, which is what if you asked me, what does Lutheran mean? That's what I would say. Christ-centered, disciple-making community. Thoughts or reactions to that? Any questions? Why do you think we still um, call ourselves Luther or Lutherans when yeah. we're so... Yeah. That's a really good question, Barbara. And the question requires a lot of conversation, which I'm going to try to shorten really, really, really small. But um, there are multiple periods of Lutheran history. And again, you know, you have the 1500s, which we would call the Reformation time period. Um, and then you have the 1600s, which is, and, and again, these are not hard and fast dates, but just general generalizations. In 1600s, there was a lot of um, departure from the teaching of the 1500s. There was, again, a return to build scaffolding and idols and basilicas and focus on those things, and there was a loss of that core teaching value. And then, and then there, was a, there was a couple of different movements um, that happened within Christianity in general that happened about that same time. One was called the Pietist Movement, which is where, have you ever heard anybody talk to you like this? Are you saved? Are you really saved? That's pietism. That's saying, how do you know that you're really saved? Like you're really, you know, it's like this, there's a, an emphasis on your actions and your sincerity and your purity. The Puritans came out of that movement. Some of the Pentecostal movements we know today can find there, some of their roots in there. Um, so that was part of it. At the same time, there was something, or not the same time, but shortly thereafter, there was sort of a, a swing to the rationalist movement. And the rationalist movement was using our reason and elevating our reason. And um, out of the rationalist movement, arguably, although there would be people who would debate this, and that's okay, that's a, a healthy debate, is there was a rise of this thing called Lutheran orthodoxy. And that's in late, teen, late 1600s, early 1700s. And one of the key Lutheran orthodoxy dudes was... Um, a fellow by the name of Johann Gerhard, and there's a lot we could talk about with him, but to answer your question, the, 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 the culture that you, we have grown up with, in large part, can be traced to Johann Gerhard's response to both the pietist and rationalist movements and trying to say what we need is purity of doctrine. And the way that we distinguish purity of doctrine, not the way, but one of the ways that we do it is through saying we're Lutheran and they aren't. And that, there was, that he, he pulled that from a movement within the Reformation time from a, a group called Genuine Lutherans, or sometimes you might hear the phrase Genesio Lutherans, um, and that he sort of played off of that. So by the time you get to the 1800s when there's this mass movement from Europe to the United States, immigration, immigration well, no, if you're, yeah, immigration from our point of view. Um, they were emigrating out of Europe into the United States, and they were coming here, and part of that process was you just had people from all kinds of faith traditions spread out across the United States, and there was a, a, a strong push to say, wait a minute, what kind of church is this? 
That's a Lutheran church, that's a Methodist church, that's a Presbyterian church, that's a Baptist church, and there was that strong, important thing. And there were some good reasons for some of that because we don't want to have syncretism and unionism, which is to say where it doesn't matter, doctrine doesn't matter, um, but at the same time, ooh, maybe went really too far with that, at least in some, some cases, yeah. So that's where the name and the tradition come from um, and why it's used so intensively. Yeah, that's a great question. Did I, Stephanie? We just think that we like to put things in boxes and we like to know what we know. So we went to a couple of different non-denominational churches, but mm -hmm. it became very clear quite quickly what was behind it. Right. Non-denominational is another word for Baptist light. That's just what that's what it is. Well, and that, that is exactly what it was. Um, so when we when I say I go to praise and worship, and they're like, "Well, what is that?" and I come out with it's a Christ-centered disciple-making community, yeah. they're going to say, "Well, what what yeah. else is it?" Yeah. You know, nobody's fooled by just a name without a denomination attached. And I'm not. We're not seeking to fool anyone. Um, what we're seeking to do is to immediately, right off the bat, indicate that we are less interested in those categories, even though, you know, people will say the same thing to me, what kind of church is it? I was like, well, we're a Lutheran church, but we love to focus on Jesus. That's what that means, you know, and so I, it's not, we're not ever trying to play bait and switch, nothing like that. But you can call this church, we love Jesus, and they would say, okay, well, what do exactly. you Exactly, that's exactly right, yeah. Because they're wanting us to, to, they want to understand. They want to use their categories to understand. And so yes, it is appropriate to say this is a Lutheran church. But what I don't want people to think is that if you walk into five Lutheran churches, and this is true no matter where you're at in the United States, if you walk into five Lutheran churches, you're gonna get five different experiences. You just are, okay? And part of the reason for that is we aren't a true denomination in the true sense of the word. Normally denomination means that you have an organization that's kind of a federal body, and then they, they, they spread out into these local um, outposts of that federal body. That isn't what the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod is. It is, a, it is a synod, okay? And a synod means we just agreed to walk together and we share a confession. And the confession does not say how to do anything. It does not say how to worship. This is what everybody is very confused about in our time now. It does not say how to do potlucks. I personally think we have a pretty good potluck plan here. Uh, it does not say how to do you know, baptisms. It does not say how to do the Lord's Supper. It does not say how to do any of these very big things which we all get in arguments about. It says, follow Jesus and use his word to do it. And it says it over and over and over again. Now, there are times in the confession that we share where it'll say, hey, we're not, we don't have to throw out the historical traditional stuff. We don't have to throw any of that out. We can use all of that. In fact, in the Augsburg Confessions Apology, which is when the, the Catholic Church was like, ah, you guys are crazy, and then they wrote an apology, which says to respond to that, Philip Melanchthon, who, who wrote those words, he responded by saying, well, actually, we don't mind any of those traditional worship services, but whatever we do, it has to be efficacious to the hearer. It has to teach those who are there. It has to be a community and an environment where they're growing in their faith, not doing mindless rituals, not doing what the, he used the Latin phrase ex opera operato, which means where the doing of the thing is what makes you holy rather than Jesus. And so that was kind of his, that's kind of his focus. So, so in our case, while we do have a fellowship, a synod, a walking together with our, our brethren, if you go into different churches, you're going to get different experiences because what I believe, and it's, I think it's evident, is that the Holy Spirit is growing each of those churches to reach out to the people they're called to be with. And so um, Faith Lutheran downtown is called to be a, a church for the Lutherans, and that's what they do. And they, they will also gather some people that are um, non-Christians, and that's because the mission will work. God's Word does things amazing. But they're not built from the ground up for that. We are built from the ground up for that. So what I always tell people, like, there's nothing wrong with any of those traditions, nothing. In fact, we celebrate them, and we actually will teach on them too. But what our calling is, and our focus, and our purpose is, is to reach people who know nothing about them. And so we don't lead with those. We, we end with those, yeah. We conclude by explaining and teaching those, yeah. Did you have a, did I, I missed another hand somewhere. Okay. 
If you give it, yeah, yes. You talk about your uh, point, Luther's point on Romans. Yeah. So in my college years, I got to the place where I was doing the same thing. I could, there, there was no way I could be sinless. Right, know? right. And that's what I was hearing. Yeah. And I couldn't have a relationship, and I wanted a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. And so I had a really good friend that took me through the book of Romans. Yeah. And that became my foundation forever. Yeah. For, for the rest of my life. Well, yeah, and I mean, I mean, it's it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful summary of the whole Bible in one little place, and it and, it, and what's also important is um, because Paul is a bit of a is a bit of a systematician, which is a lack of a better word, but um, he he in his mind he is like giving you this is how this whole thing comes together, yeah, um, and again when he does that he's carried by the Holy Spirit himself, and when he writes so it's God's word, yeah. Um, but he used Paul's different way of doing it. Like if you read Peter, Peter's going to come at it from this cosmic kind of like, you know, you know, did you know that when Jesus was crucified on the cross, he went down and proclaimed victory to the prisoners. And you're like, wait, what, wait, what? And you know, you know he, Peter's like, Paul is like, now you got to know that when you have sin, it's gonna, you're going to struggle with it, right? It's going to, the good that you don't want to do, that you keep on doing, the bad that you, do, you don't want to do, that you won't do, the good you want to do, you're not doing, all these things. And then who's going to rescue me from this? Jesus. It's like Paul was in his heart, Peter, heart, heart. Paul was in his head, Peter was I think more right. emotional. I think you're right. And you see that in the narrative. Um, I think Paul was emotional too, but he was more, it was more cerebral for him. But Peter, you know, what, what happens on Easter Sunday? Peter just runs into the, into the tomb, you know, and, and, you know, John and the others are like, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm sorry, Chris. Well, I just was going to say, uh, just from the journey that I've been on, and this is just a little bit of a personal thing, but mm-hmm. I think there starts to become a fatigue in our society mm-hmm. of where do you belong if you are a Christian? Yeah. Like, are you a Baptist? Are you a non-denominational? Are you a Pentecostal? I don't speak in tongues, but I am a Pentecostal. Am right. I, you know, am I this or am I that? And yeah. it really does all boil down to, am I a Christian? Am yes. I a Christ follower? Do I live for Christ? Yeah. Like, and then what, how do we break that down and what does that mean? And that's more turning to churches going, Help us figure this out because we do have Jesus. Like we know we belong to Him. Yes. But then try and get seated in an organization where you feel like your your viewpoint on Romans it matches up. Uh-huh. Like how do we? And then I'm looking. We've been in this community ten months now, and our daughter is in public school here. Yeah. And there is so much brokenness yeah. here. I mean, there's broken everywhere. Oh, exactly. Yeah. We get to be a light for the brokenness here. And that's a really big deal. Yeah. And so I guess my question for you is, and I know you've been praying and visiting with all this with a lot of people here, but how do we get to the point as a congregation where we're not coming across as Lutheran, yeah. hold on to our doctrine and just be the light so people can come in and go? These people know Jesus. Like yeah. this is just Jesus. Like how do we, how do we get there? Now I promise, Chrissy and I did not rehearse this conversation, but you literally have set up the whole point that we're going to make. I mean, this is because your question is precisely what we seek to study when we ask the question, "Where are we coming from?" Um, if you go to the front of your handout, I want to answer your question by basically continuing the study because it's precisely designed to answer that question. Um, we had to answer sort of the Lutheran question first because of what you said, and the question is now, how do we actually just be the light of the world? Because that's what we're called to be. And, and how do we not come across with some of our traditions first, or how do we learn and grow in that? And so that's where this red line where we say Christ-centered disciple-making community, we have to break that down because Christ-centered, we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to talk about disciple-making because disciple-making is the answer to your question, the short answer. The longer answer is, well, what do you mean by that? And we'll, you know, what does this mean? And that's what we're going to study as we go the next few weeks. Um, I want to answer the question, what does Christ-centered? And really, really open this up. And for that, I would love for you to open your Bibles. There's Bibles around your chairs there. And turn to Titus chapter 3. So Titus chapter 3. And let me get you a page number on that. And if somebody beats me there, it's going to be page 1182. Somehow I just landed on it. Page 1182 in the Chair Bibles. If you love to use your mobile app, feel free to dial that up as well. 
Titus chapter 3, um, is, there's many places we could go to answer what does Christ-centered mean, but um, this is a, a really well-stated, or no, well-stated is not the right language, but it's a really simple, clear stated, clearly stated. Um, so Titus chapter 3 comes in the middle of this little letter that Paul is writing by the power of the Holy Spirit to his apprentice, one of his, one of his students, Titus, who is growing and learning how to be a pastor. And um, in the midst of that, um, these words beginning in verse 3, well, yeah, we'll pick it up in verse 4. So Paul writes by the power of the Spirit, when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us because of the righteous things we've done. Oh, it doesn't say that. He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth. We, we receive those words as baptism. And renewal by the Holy Spirit. So he saved us through baptism and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously. And generously there is an emphasized kind of word. It's a strong emphasis there. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So, so you see that right there, that's, that's how salvation, that's how the, 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 the bringing of God's good news, his mercy, his grace to us. Look at verse 7. Why is he doing all of this? There's the so that. There's the equal sign. This is why. Having been justified, it's a big fancy word which means God has declared you perfect. Having become justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Now look at what he says next. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have, been trust, who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. So when we say we're Christ-centered, we're really thinking of this paragraph, among others, but this paragraph. Um, because the word Christ means Messiah. That's the, it's the Greek version of the Hebrew word Messiah. Messiah means the, the anointed one the one who was to come, as people would say to Jesus, we believe you're the one who was to come. And you know, John the Baptist was, you know, when he was in prison about to get beheaded, he's like, wait a minute, are you the one who was to come? Because this doesn't look like the kingdom of God for me. I'm about to get my head chopped off. And he eventually did. And um, Jesus was like, blessed are those who do not fall away on account of me. <coughs> on account of me, right? And so that's why we're going to be centered on him. In John chapter 5, he goes, you guys keep seeking for the eternal life because you think you find them in the scriptures, but you find them in me because the scriptures are about me, right? So we're sitting there going, okay, we're going to be, we're going to be focused on Jesus. That's what we're going to do because that's what he said to do because he is the one through which we are saved and then can join him in his mission, which we're going to talk about in the next section. Yeah, questions or thoughts on Christ-centered? I feel like that verse um, demolishes every other, I'm going to use the word denominational, mm -hmm. but denominational perspective on behavior. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying behavior isn't important. I'm just saying that's not how you determine whether you are right. saved. Exactly. In fact, right here in verse eight, he says, "No, you need to. It's because you have been saved. You should devote yourselves to doing what is good." Yeah, behavior is right there with it. In fact, a lot of Lutherans don't. Really, now I'm going. I'm going full on Lutheran culture here. But a lot of Lutherans don't know that the Augsburg Confession in Article Five, which we all love to talk. If you're like, if you don't know what I'm talking about, let it go. But the idea is Article 4, Article 4 is saying the church rises and falls essentially on justification by grace through faith, which is what we just read. But Article 5 says the good works are, are necessary. They're necessary because of what the Bible says. This is why I love it. The Book of Concord never uses the word Lutheran. It never does. The, the, our confessions never use that word. It keeps pointing us to Scripture. Back to Scripture. He says, I want you to stress this things, these things so that they'll do good. That's what that, in other words, the view of Scripture is that good works come out of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit are love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. Not the fruit of Mark or the fruit of Tommy or anybody else, right? And so 
what happens is, is we, we put our hope and our trust and our faith in Jesus. We center our lives on Jesus, and then he will, he will by his spirit, do some cool, amazing things through us. And all we have to do is look around. And he, come on in, guys. All we have to do is look around, and we see that happening. So, go ahead. Not to confuse, not, not to make this a black and white thing, but is it safe to say, from a deeds perspective, um, it's, it's, you can consider a response versus a requirement. Now, I, I, I feel like it is required of us to mm -hmm. behave in a, in a proper manner, but, yeah. but the lever there is not about my salvation. Nope. All right? So that's a gift. Yeah. Right? Salvation. salvation is freely given. And then our response, as you well said, is the way that we, we handle it. But what happens is, is if you get into these weird games, and this is, why it's, this is why the Augsburg Confession speaks the way it does, there are people who play games with this. Well, if I'm saved by grace through faith alone, then I don't need to do anything to be saved, which is a factually true statement. However, the ironic thing is if you begin to hold that view, then what you're actually doing is you're not living by faith. James says, faith without works is dead. And that is still scripture. And so what we do is we hold those intention and we look at this and we're like, oh no, it's very clear. Good works arise from the indwelling of the spirit. So at some point, if you've said to yourself, I like to sin, God likes to forgive, this is gonna work out great, that's gonna be a problem. And Paul says in Galatians 5, right before the fruit of the spirit, if you continue in, in the way of darkness, if you, you know, he says, if you live like this, and he gives a list of things like fits of rage, orgies, drunkenness, debauchery, all those kinds of things. If you live like that, if that's your life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it's kind of like with, 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 you see it so clear, saved by grace through faith. But if you don't have faith, you're not saved by grace. And right? that's a free gift as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, really good. It's an important discussion, and it will continue. Actually, in the worship service, which we must prepare for now. So um, today, we're, we're talking about receiving the forgiveness of God in our worship service. So it'll be, we'll pick this up in more detail. So with that, let's pray and conclude our time together. Father, we thank you for all that you give us, and we pray boldly for you to take these these core values that we have and the where we are coming from in, in our PW 101 class uh, into our hearts so that we say we're just simply broken people who don't have all the answers, but we seek the face, your face, the face of the one who does. His name is Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, guys. For more information and for more audio and video content, visit www.branson.church.